So, Ben and I are going to do a bit of a, a team effort and uh, cut an interchange a bit uh, in the course of the next hour or so. Daniel's been in court all day today and so entrusted me with the slides. So uh, if, uh, if anything goes wrong in the slide deck or if Daniel hasn't seen anything, then that's uh, obviously a deliberate uh, trip up on my part. Hopefully, hopefully we'll manage to get through it. Just a bit about me, uh, by way of background, um, and hopefully to uh, yeah, to suggest that I've got uh, a little bit of uh, relevant knowledge and expertise in this particular area. Uh, my background actually is in finance, I trained as an accountant, uh, and in 2003, by, yeah, by some work of faith, I ended up getting a job at the FA. Uh, and they wanted me to look at, uh, in particular at the time, they wanted me to look at uh, the, uh, the background of uh, financing the transfer market uh, and issues within the transfer market at that, ten, at that time. Uh, my job, I was there at the FA for six years and my role developed into the uh, financial regulation, uh, which meant overseeing uh, not only the transfer market and players' agents, but also uh, the financial side, uh, English club football. Uh, and ended up with me on uh, representing English football on the UEFA licensing committee. Uh, I was also head of integrity for the FA, so I was all, uh, the FA's relationship with betting and uh, the work that it does uh, to control uh, match fixing uh, in that area. That's obviously, uh, after that, I became chief executive of Portsmouth Football Club for two years, uh, shortly well, after it had gone into uh, administration the first time. Uh, and I used to try and salvage it from uh, a fairly uh, significant financial distress that it was in at the time, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, a bit later on. Um, as I mentioned, I was uh, involved in uh, at UEFA level in the setting up of the formation of the idea of financial fair play. I sat on UEFA's licensing committee, and subsequently, when I was at Portsmouth, I was also on the working group uh, for financial fair play for the League Championship. Uh, I now work at a company called Sport Radar, which some of you may have heard of, but actually is not, is not too well known, despite being uh, kind of the world leader in its area. So Sport Radar actually does most of the uh, anti-match fixing monitoring, so it runs the systems to monitor the anti-match fixing uh, in sports worldwide. Uh, in particular, it, has, uh, it does it through UEFA, so it covers uh, all 54 UEFA nations, the top two divisions and the competitions. Uh, for potential match fixing and irregularities. Uh, but uh, its core business is actually data and the provision of uh, data relating to sport. Uh, our markets are obviously part of the betting market, but also uh, in the media. Uh, I'll let Daniel say a few words about himself before we move on. you very quick. So I'm Daniel G, um, a lawyer at a firm called uh, Field Fisher Waterhouse. Um, and I'm it's actually the largest screen I've ever had to pull up in London, so I think that's my best greatest start of the day. Um, these are some of the things that I've talked about generally, but I think what I think most people are interested in hearing about are effectively the practicalities of a lot of the, the financial aspects of sport and football in particular. So um, I don't want to bang on about some of the things that I've managed to do. That's just a, a highlight of some of the things I've done over the last 10 years or so. Um, but really, I think the important thing is I'm, I'm as interested as you guys to listen to David talk about some of his practical experiences. I can then set the scene for um, what FFP uh, relates to in terms of the Premier League and the Football League, less about UEFA. And then David will be able to sum up some of the lessons learned and structural issues that I think are probably of value going forward. So I'm back over to David. Sorry if that hasn't given you a lead in time. <laughs> so, no, no, that's absolutely fine. So, yeah, I guess uh, my starting point was where did, where did FFP come from? So, I think I was first approached about um, the idea of financial fair play in 2008 by UEFA, and they were, uh, you know, they were thinking about ways in which they could stem some of the uh, financial problems across uh, European football. And, so I've just highlighted, I guess, some of the some of the problems, some of the concerns uh, that were around at that time and have perpetuated since. But obviously, 
In the last 20 years or so, the financial landscape of football has changed dramatically, in particular in this country uh, since the birth of the Premier League. Uh, and you see there, although well, it's more specified, but that 170 million is the old football league, the first division of the football league uh, in 1991. Uh, and obviously that has gone up uh, by, I would say, more than 14 times in the intervening period. Um, but despite that growth in revenue, and the growth in revenue has been uh, pan-European, uh, there have been persistent uh, and chronic financial problems experienced across the European landscape. Uh, not just uh, not just in the UK, although some countries have uh, experienced worse problems than others, or some countries have coped better than others. Uh, and I'll speak, <coughs> excuse me, I'll speak a little bit later on. Uh, about uh, what they do in Germany, actually how uh, the German model has stemmed some of those financial problems. Uh, a few, uh, just a few specific uh, issues: clubs and players not meeting their financial obligations. And in 2012, or in 2010, 2012, FIFPRO, which is the uh, international uh, um, association union for football players, uh, did a very significant study into uh, the payment of players in particular, and found that actually 41% of players uh, across Eastern Europe have been paid late. And some of the statistics in that report are pretty alarming. I, I certainly recommend having a look at it if you have an interest in that area. Uh, but also, one of the other issues, not just in relation to players, was inter-club debt. So clubs just not paying each other. And that obviously causes a potential problem, because if one club goes under, it can have a domino effect. And in this country, we have the football creditor rule, which Hopefully, it's something that many of you are aware of. It effectively protects clubs' debt into club debts. So, if you are owned by another club, whatever happens, that club has to pay even if they go into insolvency. Uh, that doesn't exist in other countries, and so the issue of into club debt was high on the agenda uh, for the world uh, in terms of protecting the position. As I mentioned there, over 90 club insolvencies in the UK since 1992. It's not a record that we should be. Uh, in any way proud of, particularly given the enormous commercial and financial success that we generated in uh, English football. Uh, the fact that that has not uh, in any way stemmed uh, financial problems across the Pyramid, in particular below the top level, uh, is, uh, is a source for, uh, for concern. And one of the other things that uh, I think was uh, in uppermost in people's minds uh, back then, and probably still to a certain extent now, is uh, the issue that clubs are being funded uh, by external sources of wealth. And that potentially, first of all, that's potentially not sustainable if you have a football club that simply cannot run by and of itself. Uh, but it also exposes that club to risks in the external market, wherever, wherever that funding is coming from. And again, we'll touch on that a bit later on. <coughs> One of the other things uh, that has been very well documented is obviously increasing levels of debt. So, on the back of all of that, in 2008-2009, UEFA um, got a, uh, a group of people together, I was one of them, uh, to think about ways in which some of these problems could be uh, alleviated. Um, and a couple of the early questions that were, I guess, floated in those meetings were around, well, could a simple salary cap uh, have done the job, rather than the uh, yeah, pretty bureaucratic uh, structure that has gone into financial fair play? And Danny will go into some of the detail, and in fact, some of the ways in which the structure of financial fair play differs at European level, at Premier League level, at Football League level, and even within the Football League, between the Championship and these one and two. So that, that creates an awful lot of uh, complexity, the opportunity for confusion, and also problems for clubs that switch between uh, those divisions, or indeed playing with the football or don't play with the football. So, I mean, a simple answer on the salary cap is that in, uh, at that time, and uh, I guess until further notice, and then I want to say a word or two about this from a legal point of view, uh, that the salary cap uh, was deemed illegal on the European law uh, to create a cap on uh, an individual's right to earn their living uh, in commercial terms. Obviously in the United States, salary caps do operate and are a mechanism by which this US force uh, control spending within their, uh, within their club environment. 
One other question, which just by way of background, and I know it's not our intention to focus on on European uh, on the European aspects today, but I, I think it is a relevant question as to why European level intervention uh, was considerable required. Actually, UEFA, I guess in most people's minds now, UEFA has become a regulator. Um, and they're well known to what they do on financial fair play and other areas that are quite active in the matrix and for example. Uh, but actually, prior to financial fair play, they didn't do a lot of regulation. They were primarily a competition organizer and they organized the Champions League and the Europa League as they are now uh, and the European Championships every four years. And so, actually, it's financial fair play is, has meant that one is seeing a shift in the, in the role of UEFA as a governing body as opposed to uh, a confederation and competition organizer. But why is that why is that relevant? Well the reality is that clubs competing in European competition are ultimately competing against one another despite the financial different financial backgrounds of their domestic leagues. So if you if you put a potential regulation to Manchester United they will be concerned that if that regulation doesn't also apply to the Real Madrid or, uh, or FC Porto or Bayern Munich, they may be less concerned next year, by the way, but we won't go into that. But they would be concerned, <laughs> for the time being, let's say they'll be concerned uh, about the fact that other clubs in other, uh, in other territories and other countries uh, would not be subject to the same rules. And a lot of you would have also heard and know about the fact that. For example, television rights are sold differently in different countries. So in Spain, television rights are sold by clubs individually, which means that actually 60% of the revenue from TV broadcasting in Spain goes to the top two clubs, Madrid and Barcelona, with the rest shared out with everyone else, whereas in the UK or in, in the English league, it's shared much more evenly. So for those reasons, European level intervention was seen as critical, but it was also seen, I think, as an opportunity for UEFA uh, to change gears in terms of the way it is oriented as, a, as an organisation. So these are actually the official, these are the official line uh, in terms of what the objectives of UEFA's financial fair play uh, was from the outset. To improve the economic and financial capability of its clubs, to place the necessary importance on the protection of creditors, that was what I was uh, speaking about a moment ago, and about protecting uh, debts between clubs in particular. To introduce more discipline and rationality to the clubs' local finances. Uh, to encourage clubs to operate on the basis of their own revenues, and I think that's kind of broadly seen as the, uh, yeah, the underlying principle of financial fair play is that clubs can be what they feel, but they can live within their means, uh, and they should seek to do so. To encourage responsible spending for the long-term benefit of football and to protect the long-term viability and sustainability of European football. So, for me, those are good as far as they go. They're honourable, and I was uh, I was uh, involved in uh, I guess arguing the toss on some of those issues and how they should be uh, how they should be put together. Because initially, in, in terms of how financial fair play came into being, the rest were quite politically. Astute, and they got these principles agreed by all of the clubs uh, before anyone had even spoken about what that would actually mean in practice in terms of the regulations. And so once the principles were agreed, it was very difficult for any of the clubs to go back on anything and say, <coughs> put forward a set of regulations that deliver on those principles. But for me, they are, they are also of interest because of what isn't in there. Uh, and we'll talk again, I'll talk a bit later on about some of the limitations in financial fair play and it is, you know, to my mind, it is a very good thing. It's a good thing that financial fair play has come in uh, and that there is uh, a, a tentative change towards more rationality, should we say, uh, in football club finances, but it is also limited and on its own it is not going to solve all of the problems in football. So as I say, we'll touch a little bit later on on some of the things that perhaps it doesn't do so well or some of the things that aren't within the scope of the financial fair play. I'll now hand over to Daniel to, to give you a bit of the, the detail on UEFA for the living Thanks, Dave. Very interesting. Yeah, very stand on that. Okay. okay. Um, so being said, we've got a lot to answer for, and I don't think we're involved in all. Essentially, 
Um, two slides, more or less, just to illustrate a couple of things, because although they're UEFA bets, um, I think some of these statistics from the latest UEFA benchmarking reports are really actually very um, uh, interesting and illustrative for a couple of reasons. I think the, the general um, discussion and discourse about financial fair play, we're talking about from Premier League, from UEFA, from Football League, even the Premier League, don't have to call it is that it's not working, it won't have teeth, sanctions won't be quick enough, people will find loopholes, there'll be ways around it, and um, a generally relatively cynical about the whole, the whole process. And the first thing that I always say to people when they, when that cynicism comes across from the first instance is to say, well, have you seen the latest UA benchmarking report? Because I think it says a number of really interesting things that show actually that from a UEFA level, at least initially, that um, FFP, break even, you know, paying creditors, um, is actually working. And so if I, if I point you to two things, actually on the next. And these, I think, are two of the most interesting stats in European football at the moment. And the first one is, if you look at the far right and top, you can see that it says, for the first time in recent history, it's been a 600 million euro plus reduction in club losses. That's in one season. It's gone from almost 1.8 billion to, not quite work out, around yeah, 1.2. 1.7 to about 1.1. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the point being is that this, this is on, I think, on the 11, 12 accounts for a number of European clubs that are competing in European competition. For me, this is the basis of showing that clubs are having to rein in their spending and rein in relatively quickly because they know of the effects and consequences um, of FFP and potential sanctions that are in place. That's the first thing. And the second one is just illustrating the, that there's been a 70% reduction in the overdue payables to at the club. So it's if, for example, a club owes another club money on a transfer fee, <coughs> but owes players money, or if it uh, owes a tax authority. There's been a 70% reduction because they know that because of the new enhanced regulations in the UEFA um, provisions, that they will be sanctioned harshly accordingly. And you only have to look to the Malaga decision, to the Shiktas decision, to FC Gori, I think, as well, as well as a number of clubs, to show that UEFA are taking a very hard line on the overdue payable part, never mind the break points. So, my first message. Sorry, no, I was only going to say, on the, I mean, I think the overdue pay payables is a, is a really critical aspect. It's critical also because it's possibly the easiest to judge. It's the most black and white. And so, clubs have already found that it's you know, one of the hardest to get around. And I think Andrew will go on to talk about some of the, some of the areas where perhaps it's a bit grey. But actually, overdue payables in black and white. You've either paid somebody or you haven't. You've either negotiated uh, different payment terms or you haven't. And as, as Daniel's already referred to, most of the most of the clubs that have been um, kicked out of or prevented from accessing European competition in the last uh, two to three years have, uh, have had that uh, have had that decision on the back of the overdue payables, and it is clearly having some uh, material effect on the ground, which is good to see. And I think the interesting thing is that you can distinguish between the two types of sanctions, regardless of you UEFA or anything else, is it is very much black and white for the overdue payments. If you do not pay your debts to clubs or the tax man by a certain date, you are extremely likely to be expelled from competition. That's more or less the point, I think, really. Like some clubs are being expelled from competition from very minor debt breaches. I mean, debt in terms of debt tables are other club breaches. Whereas we'll talk about second for financial fair play and break even, there may be proportions of if you are a certain million euros or pounds over what's acceptable, whether that will actually mean expulsion or whether that will mean uh, something slightly different. There's quite, there's quite a good little story. I think this is right from the uh, Greek star season. You know, briefly, uh, they have a playoff at the end of the season for the last position to get access to uh, Europa League. And so the two clubs, I think I'm right to say the two clubs in that playoff were Panathinaikos and a club called uh, Ghana. And so they had a playoff, and Panathinaikos won the playoff. And then in any event, both clubs were disbarred from 
competed in European competition despite the fact that they had a plan to, uh, to see who could get access to the Europa. So it is, I mean, it's fair to say that Europa, uh, UEFA are absolutely acting on this, uh, on this area and this step is having a material effect. Very much so. And anyone that thinks that UEFA won't be sanctioning clubs in the next few months for break even reaches, I think, is very, uh, very much mistaken. But I know that uh, Gambias was very much keen on discussing maybe the domestic side of things. Uh, but I'll touch on more or less this is just a very much a snapshot of everything FFP, cost control related for a Premier League or a, a Championship club. And very briefly, um, the UEFA perspective is this that clubs um, for this season, let's just take this season, competing in the Champions League or Europa League for this season, would have had to have submitted their 11 and 12, 12, 13 accounts to the club financial control body, which is an arm of separate independent arm of UEFA, which then investigates into all of the accounting practices, effectively. Um, and for those two accounting periods, a club can only make a loss of 45 million euros, which isn't a significant amount of money. <coughs> there are a range of exempted costs, so for example, infrastructure, youth development, training ground, community scheme, all of the costs that are associated with that type of investment um, are excluded costs, so they come out of the 45 million euro uh, amount. But still, um, 45 million euros at least for the first two, for the last two accounting periods, which then changed into three accounting periods going forward, um, isn't a significant amount of money um, and will potentially cause a lot of uh, problems for, um, for, for breaking even. And when we say breaking even, we don't quite mean break even now, we mean breaking even in the sense of not breaching 45 million euro permitted loss. So that's your waiver. Um, if I go in a chronological order, then the Football League effectively um, came next. Uh, and you may have seen there's quite a lot of controversy at the moment about the Football, uh, football League regulations that's potentially being challenged by a number of um, number of championship clubs themselves, uh, possibly because they think they uh, may breach the, um, the permitted losses that are set out here. Let's set out in a bit more detail on other, uh, on other tables a bit further on, but that's just more for your reference that you can I'm sure you can download from somewhere afterwards. Effectively, what football league rules mean are that um, the football league demands the previous year's worth of accounts of a championship club in order to adhere to the rules, and that effectively means now that um, first decisions of football league for um, FFP-related matters will come down in. Uh, January 2015, so relatively soon will be the first decisions. And they will be based on this season, this accounting season, the 13-14 season. So clubs are currently in their first compliance accounting period, even though they only have to submit the accounts at the end of this year. And in order to comply, they effectively can only make a committed loss of up to £8 million in this accounting season. Although part of that can be just a normal loss, and part of it has to be equity contributions from effectively the owner to be able to subsidize those losses. And if the owner doesn't make those equity contributions, then um, those losses that are committed uh, increase accordingly. Um, so like, I won't talk about that because I'm quite that time. But then to talk about um, Premier League then quickly as well. Um, the Premier League were effectively last to the party um, in setting out their type of financial cost control regulations. They don't call it FFP, presumably because they think it's a bit of an anathema that the financial fair play is called financial fair play. I presume some people don't think that that is that much fair play about it. It's not got let and they talk, let's talk about it afterwards. It's not to do with competitive balance in a way, to ensure that clubs are living within their means effectively. Um, and and the Premier League, what the Premier League has effectively done, which is interesting because it's different from what UEFA and what Football League have done and said, um, is that Premier League club over a three year period, so a longer period than Football League and a similar period to UEFA, have said that clubs can make uh, 105 million pounds worth of loss. 105 million pounds, which is significantly more than UEFA committed loss of 45 million euros, and 
be more significant than the eight million pounds worth of loss. Bearing in mind that the football league was over one council series, a council period. So the interesting point about the Premier League rules is that um, it relates to what's called significantly secured funding. So the majority, 90 million of that 105 million pounds worth of loss that is committed, has to be uh, guaranteed by the owner, which effectively means the money has to be sitting in a bank account in escrow, has to have a bank guarantee from a bank to say to the Premier League that that money is available should the club then get into financial difficulty afterwards. And the last thing just to mention on, uh, on the Premier League is that um, David perfectly set me up for, um, for this comment, which was people don't, people don't think there's a type of salary cap, um, salary, type of salary cap in football at the moment. And while that's true, was true before the beginning of the season with the Premier League, if you look at Premiership Rugby, for example, who's had a salary cap from 1999, better than no one's challenged that to date. And although um, it's been very much within people's reason to be able to challenge uh, uh, potentially restrictive rules, sporting rules or any other type of rules at the moment, there's, no, there's been no challenge to Premiership Rugby's um, salary cap. So at the moment, everyone, well, it's not illegal, but it's going on and no one thinks otherwise. But the point about what I was getting back to was the Premier League now has a any leagues, football league or the Premier League, has effectively, I believe, implemented a soft salary cap. And not a lot of people, I think, realise that in within what's happened in the Premier League rules for this season. And that salary cap is effectively uh, based on last season's wage costs. Premier League club can only increase its wage bill by four million pounds for this season. Let me say that again. Your Man United, you've got your 2012-13 wage bill, you can only increase your wage bill for the 13-14 season by four million pounds. Now there are some significant um, exceptions to that, but that's the general principle there. And then lastly, on sanctions, the thing I would just mention is for the Premier League and UEFA, everything's on the table effectively, barring probably relegation, I can't imagine a Premier League um, Tribunal or arbitration committee that's validating uh, a club, but there's no doubt that it could come in directly through points deductions, um, etc. But specifically with football league, and this is a controversy I think there's at the moment where people have been saying, uh, What did QPR get promoted? and they made potentially large losses for periods that they were in the Premier League or the football league. The way the football league regulations are structured is that if for the period when sanctioning kicks in for clubs that compete in the football league, that club is promoted to the Premier League, then that club will be fined. Question mark over who will be fining if they're no longer a member of the football league is a different question. But that's the theory is that a club will be fined if they're no longer in the football league. If sorry, in the championship. But if they are still in the championship by the time the sanction occurs, then there will be effectively a transfer embargo. And that transfer embargo is <coughs> what it says on the tin. There are a couple of exceptions. If you sell a player, you can buy another one in for 75% of his gross value effectively. But it also means you can't renegotiate existing contracts with players either. And that transfer embargo is effectively there until you can prove to the football league you're going to break even for the next period, which is quite a substantive and sort of high barrier to be able to actually uh, attain. So that's a very quick snapshot of um, of FFP for UEFA, for Premier League, and for um, Football League level. Hopefully, I haven't lost you with too many figures. Um, what I'm not going to do is give you lots and lots of figures, but I can give you these and you guys can kind of maybe afterwards for for these. This is the UEFA acceptable loss <coughs> table. This is the Football League acceptable loss table. It's not going to time for me to do this a while back. And this is the Premier League salary, better the soft salary cap um, table. Um, so I can circulate these on uh, Twitter or um, something at the later time. We'll give these to, uh, to be able to be circulated so I can have a good reason. I don't think I've quite got enough time to talk in detail about this because I think this is one of the things that's on a lot of people's lips. And it's not necessarily just Manchester City and their sponsorship arrangements. 
Um, but the one thing I want to say about this and other types of sponsorship arrangements to do with UEFA is that, um, well, there's two things. One is, very briefly, and maybe this is the interactive part of the session, perhaps. Um, Man City, Etihad, £400 million pounds, shirt stadium, and Etihad campus field. Let's break that down gradually. Is everyone at the time saying, this is disgraceful, Etihad simply are a connected party to Manchester City, they're simply giving them new revenue to be able to uh, provide um, subsidies, break even, and the FFP. Now, does anybody know the highest shirt sponsorship in the Premier League at the moment? So my general point being, thanks for it from there, is um, let's just say for example that uh, out of that 400 million, um, 40 million a season over 10 seasons, uh, let's say 25 million of that is on shirt, 10 million of that is on stadium, and 5 million on the is anyone suggesting to me that £25 million pounds now is fair value or not, or not market rate for um, top Premier League clubs that's competing in Champions League? Liverpool have got that with uh, standard charts effectively, um, and they haven't been in the Champions League for a couple of seasons now. So, my, my, my quick point about Manchester City and other cases, and it's not even necessarily to do with Manchester City, City is just effectively the illustration showing. Before you see the controversy about who is sponsoring who and the types of revenues that are coming in, it's worthwhile considering whether actually um, the value that the club is getting from certain sponsorship deals actually equates to what potentially the market value for type of deals are that are going on uh, in the market today. I think, I think it's best to the PSG deal looks a little bit less. <laughs> a little bit less uh, Justifiable, I don't know if anyone knows about the PSG deal, but I think the PSG deal was 150 million. Yeah. Right, it's 100. Yeah. So do that. But I, am I right saying that the PSG deal was 150 million over three years, something like that? And <coughs> excuse me, in context, I think it was more than five times the level of any previous sponsorship deal in, uh, <coughs> in uh, Liga in France. So. There is going to have to be a, a reckoning, and UEFA, I think, will be putting more test on how they deal with uh, some of these transactions. And obviously, the added interest with PSG is uh, the Qatari link to, uh, well, to World Cup voting and all sorts of other things. Um, <coughs> I think there was a meeting at the Elysee Palace that has gone, but there's been more reported. The Qataris, Mr. Platini, and Mr. Sarkozy. So uh, they are definitely going to be put to the test. I mean, UEFA, I mean so far, UEFA has effectively said at every stage uh, and every part of country in this field that uh, they will stand by their regulations and can be applied uh, by the letter of the rule. Um, but I think it's all that's put to the test, which will come in about 18 months' time for, uh, for the relevant financial reporting periods. Uh, I think Everyone's jury will, be, uh, will probably be out, and there'll still be a bit of a skepticism as to how that's going to be handled. So, uh, and, and then just two final things before David comes in on, um, on his next slides. Um, it's just worthwhile to sign those two things. One is sanctions, as I skipped over just before, that I think is worthwhile just briefly mentioning. And for me, um, the issue is, isn't whether clubs will be sanctioned very soon actually, and um, I'll talk about that timing as a second point. Clubs are going to be sanctioned very soon for break-even breaches of FNB. There's no doubt that that's going to happen, and there's going to be lots of appeals over the same period. What for me is the person in question is what sanctions will actually be. Simply because we talk uh, about what this, the sanctions are about from UA for at least as perspective, is it raised from expulsion, docking points, fines, refusals to uh, applications uh, for registration effectively, or use a local department, rather withholding prize money or limiting the players to register for competition. So I think the point there is, and this is just a rhetorical question, if a club is 1 million euros outside of the 45 million euro allowable limit, 
does that mean they're going to be expelled? Anybody? Does anyone think that if you're five euros outside of the acceptable amount, you should be expelled from your competition? Because some people would say yes, so few not. Some people say, you know what, if you're that's if that's if you're over, then you're over. But the point that I think needs to be stressed is it would be very much down to a proportionality. Uh, from a legal perspective, from a proportionality angle, which is, does the breach uh, take the punishment, or does the punishment rather take the breach? So I would suggest it's more likely that if a club is, let's say, 50 million euros outside of the acceptable amounts, it's very likely that they're going to be on a higher scale of the punishments, which could include expulsion, probably docking points, possibly over multiple years. Whereas if you are let's say 100,000 euros outside of the 45 million euro amount, it's less likely, in my view, as a piece of first instance, you're going to get expelled from competition. Though, the financial control body may take a very hard line on clubs that are uh, ending outside of the acceptable amounts. And that's the clearest. Then the last thing uh, before um, Dave can crack on is just to signpost you now for where we are with FFP, because um, from UEFA Premier League and Football League perspective, UEFA now are probably inside eight weeks away from coming to their first break publishing or at least announcing their first break even decisions, which is a really short amount of time. Some point, some point in April, possibly beginning of May, those first decisions are going to be made public for press releases. And it's likely some clubs may be um, expelled, got points for next year. Um, the next signpost is effectively what I mentioned before, which is the Football League. The Football League will make its first sanctioning decisions in January 2015. And the Premier League is still some time off, but the Premier League, sooner rather than later, will be issuing, well, not issuing decisions, but potentially sanctioning clubs um, who are outside of their um, salary control uh, figures, um, or in three seasons' time, effectively, are outside of the 105. A million pounds, uh, a lot of them out. But that's still some time away. So to bear in mind that focus, I think at the moment now becomes UA for very soon and um, in January 2015. <coughs> Thanks, Daniel. So, yeah, I'm going I'm to say a, a little bit about what it doesn't do. But I think before I, before I do that, I just wanted to say a few words about. I guess the different approaches that have been adopted and that, uh, that Daniel has referred to. Um, as Daniel said, the order, the order of things was that UEFA brought in FFP first, then the Football League actually did so. The UEFA regulations effectively impacted the Premier League clubs because they, if they were competing or wanting to compete in European competition, they had to comply with those rules anyway. So in some ways, the Premier League was sucked in by uh, the UEFA FFP rules. The Football League came next, and the Premier League didn't, um, uh, didn't introduce their own bespoke set of rules for the Premier League until relatively uh, recently, until last year. Mm -hmm. And I only mention it because I think it highlights uh, it highlights the, the kind of the different principles that the Premier League has, uh, has considered when putting in its own regulations. And it also highlights the first point on this slide, which is dealing with competitive balance. So UEFA, from the very outset, said that whatever FFP does in relation to financial discipline, it is not going to seek to address issues around competitive balance. So basically, we want, the, we want our clubs to be financially stable. If that actually means that there is less competition between the clubs, we don't want. Now, back in 2009 10, when I was involved in the process with the UEFA and UEFA licensing committee, this was probably the biggest issue as we as the, as the English football ways with UEFA and UEFA and UEFA and UEFA because we could see uh, already, I think it was referenced in one of the slides, we could see already that one of the impacts that this uh, could have is that it effectively cements the status quo uh, financially. So if you're a big club already, FFP comes in, you're limited in what you can spend. A club below you are limited in what they can spend to catch up with you. And so you have a, a, a fairly well cemented uh, position financially uh, in terms of 
uh, keeping your uh, yeah, keeping your own mental status. Having said that, actually, one of the things that isn't much commented on is the fact that actually, if under FFP you're a top club and you fall down somehow, it's actually potentially more difficult for you to get back up. So there, there are still some significant risks uh, built in. But effectively, what the football league did is, um, you know, when we were on the when I was on the working group for football league, what we did was say, well, okay, here's the UEFA model. That's top down. That's going to apply pretty broadly across the Premier League. Premier League are already in some way uh, covered by uh, the UEFA model, and therefore it makes sense for us to adopt something that is broadly similar. And so, broadly speaking, the football league model uh, mirrors. Uh, mirrors the UEFA model in terms of the principles. Obviously, the numbers are different because it's uh, uh, clubs and uh, club finance. However, the Premier League has adopted a different approach. As Daniel said, they've, they've called it something different. Um, but really, that goes back to that initial misgiving about competitive issues. And not necessarily only about competitive values, but also about wanting to promote the, the opportunity for clubs to, uh, I guess, Chase the dream in some respect. So, what they've done, as Dan was referred to, is, uh, is implement regulations which still give a significant uh, margin of appreciation for clubs to over invest beyond what they can afford based on their revenues. Those numbers, um, Dan flashed up 105 million over three seasons, which is uh, still a pretty significant sum of money. But what they have done, which I think is, is really significant, and I'll, I'll mention it again on the future slide, is they've controlled, or they've sought to control, uh, where that money comes from and how that money is protected. So that, that money can't just leave the club in, in potential financial So there are, uh, there's, there's a reference there, or there's a reference by Daniel on the previous slide, there is this concept of secure funding. So owners who want to fund in, up to 105 million additional cash have to do it in a secure way. They uh, basically have to be on the books for that money. And I'll, again, I'll refer to that in the light of my own experiences at uh, Portsmouth at the moment. So, what, what, does it, what does it not do? It doesn't deal with investor balance at the moment, and nor does it ever sort to. That's, I think that's a big issue. Uh, we've got a really competitive top end of the Premier League this season, which I think everyone rightly is, uh, is, is saying is a very good thing. But in reality, there are still 14 clubs in the Premier League who start the season without any realistic prospect of winning. In Germany, you could say there are 19 of the 20 clubs who start the season without any realistic prospect of, uh, of winning the Bundesliga, despite the fact that the German, uh, German club finances are incredibly healthy. And, and in fact, you know, they, none of the German clubs are, are, are loss making because of the financial regulations uh, that they put in place. And they pre cursed. The Football League doesn't have the only guarantees that we mentioned uh, a moment ago, which I think is a significant uh, gap in their regulations. I hope there's something that they will look at, a gap that they will look at. FFB doesn't control ownership intentions uh, generally, so it might control uh, the actual finances, but in, in reality, if, if an owner uh, doesn't have the right intention to be a club, they can still operate with, uh, with some degree of uh, latitude in relation to the losses. I think there's a question mark as to whether it increases transparency because for us as, as ordinary punters and people who like football and follow football, we don't actually see a whole lot more of, of, of what goes on behind uh, closed doors in relation to football finance. The UEFA should be applauded for the benchmark in the survey that they publish every year. Uh, and I think that's a really important document. But in reality, uh, we're still shielded from the fact that it is so behind what goes on at our football clubs. And personally, I would love to see that uh, dramatically improved. And I also think that would help uh, promote positive behaviour. It also doesn't solve some of the sy systemic issues in the structure of our football competitions. So <clears throat> I've just referenced here something that's a particular bugbear of mine with the increase in the wealth gap. And we'll talk about that in. Uh, in wider society and wider cultural terms, uh, but in football terms, it's pretty well exaggerated as well. So, for the three year broadcast deals that are currently in place between the Football League and the Premier League, you can see there 5.5 million uh, for the Premier League for their three year broadcast deal, 
that roughly equates to there's been a parachute payment uh, kind of jigging, uh, jiggery pokery uh, in there, but that roughly equates to 93% of our forecast revenue in football going to the top 20 clubs uh, and 7% going to the next 72. Now, my view is that is actually one of the reasons why uh, there are still financial still issues with financial stability uh, within the English game, and those huge wealth gaps. Uh, have broken up over the last 20 or 30 years. And as I referenced there until the early 1980s, forecast revenue went into the old, uh, old money football league, four divisions of the football league, uh, forecast revenue was the evenly split across all 92 clubs, which is something that, you know, for, for today's generation, it just seems kind of completely incomprehensible that that's actually, that's actually the solidarity basis upon which football is, uh, is managed. But gradually that has been broken down. Uh, initially, <coughs> with a, a, a threat of a breakaway in the mid 1980s by the top clubs, uh, and then obviously in 1992, the formation of the Premier League, uh, which has effectively then ring fenced uh, that uh, earning power for the top strings against uh, the English football. But my view is actually those top 20 clubs stick on top of the best and um, uh, unique and deepest football pyramid. Uh, in world football, and actually they benefit from that. You know, the history of English football uh, and the tradition of English football that comes with uh, comes with sitting at the top of that tree uh, is incredibly valuable. And therefore, my view is that that wealth distribution uh, should be uh, realigned. The last point there is that, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, actually potentially financial fair play. Exacerbates some of those problems because financial fair play actually prevents the, uh, the outside investment now coming in to push clubs between divisions. Uh, it's hard to imagine that Hull City would be where they are in the Premier League today if there hadn't been some of that over investment. And they were eight years ago, perhaps, and you know, probably get uh, killed by a Hull City enthusiast in the audience if I get the numbers right. But yeah, certainly in the last decade. Uh, obviously, they were at the, uh, at the foot of the football in the uh, in the year of the year too. Having said that, I also, and you know, part of my background is supported direct, uh, and I'm a firm believer in the, the model of, of uh, support your ownership in football uh, and sound governance and financial discipline. And for me, Swansea City are probably the extra counterpoint to that. Again, they came from uh, the fourth division. They're now punching a lot of their weight in the Premier League, uh, and they've done that by being self-sustaining through the whole, uh, throughout the whole world, and they've maintained 20% support ownership on that entire journey, which is, uh, for me, is a truly remarkable uh, achievement and a truly remarkable story. So ultimately, well, will financial fair play eradicate the casino economics, particularly in the football league, particularly in the football league championship? And I'm not sure it will. As Daniel alluded to, the football league championship clubs who voted, uh, themselves voted for the financial fair play in the championship, now that those rules look like coming in and potentially fighting, are kind of sheepishly putting their hands up, or perhaps not so sheepishly putting their hands up and saying, actually, maybe we need to look at this again. Because, uh, yeah, my understanding uh, informally is that potentially half of the clubs in the championship may be on the wrong side of the line when it comes to the assessment of Greg Egan uh, and the new football league rules. Um, so I'm not sure that it has uh, entirely uh, or will entirely eradicate the economics. And as Daniel alluded to as well, the other reason for that is I mean, ultimately it just makes it. Uh, it just makes the, the odds or the amount that, that the owners have to risk slightly more because they can still uh, they can still overpay significantly. I think QBR the year that they the first year they got promoted back uh, promoted back in the league went up with a uh, with a, um, a cost base of about twenty nine million pounds uh, and I think that their uh, revenues were below fifteen million pounds and they were down about fifteen million so they overspent very, very significantly in order to get into the Premier League. I'm not sure that that will be uh, entirely disincentivised because once they're in the Premier League, if they have to pay the luxury tax, well, they'll probably be taken under the chin because they're guaranteed, now they're guaranteed through the parachute system uh, approximately, I think, well, well in excess of 100 million pounds uh, if they get up. So you know, they're guaranteed one year's to be in the country, they're then guaranteed. 
four years of cashing payments. So that's obviously why the chapter of credit line is because of those buildings that you know, we're just going to do. The stat that I um, heard in the week was that QPR's wage bill is this season just gone, the 12 13 season, is more than uh, Bruce and Dortmund's. <coughs> yeah, which is the start um, analogy of obvious reasons. Indeed. Well, I, I mean, and that, that goes to this is not entirely uh, on, on point in terms of the slides, but I think there, there was, going back to kind of when FFP came in, I think there was a strong feeling that um, yeah, the German clubs in particular were pushing for FFP because that was basically what they were operating to already. They were living in their names um, and they wanted everyone else uh, to play ball. And it's, it's uh, of course, no small irony that as FFP has come in, the strength and potential dominance of German clubs has started to started to evolve. And we saw that uh, last season with uh, two German clubs competing in Champions League final at, uh, at Wembley Stadium. And as you said, one of them with a wage bill below that. Uh, it's top rangers getting relegated from the Premier League, so uh, yeah, they're doing something right. <coughs> I wanted to just digress a little bit and talk a bit about my own experiences at Portsmouth, um, uh, which were uh, a mixed bag in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, from a personal point of view. Um, but I think it, I think it speaks to some of the issues that we have talked about today. So Portsmouth, as you all know, biggest financial collapse in the history of English football. I mean, one of the extraordinary teams when I went first went there, and I you know, found hard to. To believe really was that they've been in the Premier League for seven years. They had over 400 million in revenues through uh, through the front door. I was going to say through the gates, but obviously no more of it through the gates, such as the many through TV revenue. And at the end of that seven-year journey, they ended up with debts well in excess of 100 million pounds, and they had barely any infrastructure. They, they still rented their training ground from a, a local school. Um, I mean, it is, a, it is a pretty extraordinary set of, uh, of financial mismanagement. And on the back of that, when I went in, and we, uh, I went in when they were in administration, there was in the insolvency already. And uh, when, when the club came out of the administration, which was, uh, you know, which was no small exercise, the Football League actually imposed the strictest controls that it ever imposed on any, uh, on any of its clubs, probably in the club in England. And the reason I think this is relevant is that in spite of this, and you'll see that some of these things are the things that we've talked about as being part of financial fair play, and in spite of that, within two years, the club is back in its office. So, uh, you know, what did the Football League impose at that time? Well, funny enough, some of the things that have now become part of the regulatory framework. They imposed only guarantees, so they were personal guarantees that were <coughs> provided by the uh, owners and various financial undertakings. Uh, the club was basically, for the whole time I was there, the club was more or less under a, a transfer embargo. It was not necessarily a formal embargo, it wasn't that we were prevented from uh, trading, although there were times when we were uh, completely prevented from trading. But every single deal that, that the club did at that time had to be signed off. I mean, every deal goes through the league and the FA, but every deal had to be signed off financially by the league uh, in terms of the fitting within. Uh, the, the budget for the club that had been set for a, a three-year period to, uh, that they were buying. So they were buying three years of uh, budgeting. We had to provide monthly financial reports to the league, so the league literally monitored everything we did on a, on a monthly basis, make sure we were on track uh, with our finances, uh, and obviously they possibly approved those budgets before we, uh, before we set off. And when the ownership came in, they went through the same process and approved Budgets. And there were there was more or less a complete prohibition on any uh, additional debt. So we didn't have an overdraft. Uh, the owner actually was required by the league to provide them with an overdraft facility because they were obviously peaks and troughs in capital bonds. Uh, but basically the club was prohibited from taking on any debts and had to, had to live, within its, live within its means for uh, the most uh, Overdraft facility was to be provided by the owner. And on the back of that, in 18 months, the wage bill was reduced by more than 60%. It was actually significantly more than 60%, depending on what the starting point is, because by the time the club went into administration, it had shared so much of uh, 
uh, and the significant wage is the yeah, it's hard to say exactly where the benchmark would be. Um, and actually, something that has, has never been really reported, but it's actually the club's uh, accounts were never published because it ended up going back into the service. But it got within uh, 800 grand uh, of breaking even in its profit and loss account. So you think, actually, well, that's, maybe that's not so bad. But as mentioned there, it still suffered further significant financial distress. And this, uh, and this, I guess, is kind of where I end up on this issue. Whilst, whilst clubs are dependent on external financing, they, uh, they adopt significant risk. And we just jump ahead of the slide and I'll come back to the other one. Um, but as I say there, as long as clubs have that reliance on external funding, they're exposed to risks that are just outside their, their direct control. So West Ham, obviously, down the road from here, I don't know if you've got any comments uh, in the audience tonight, but West Ham nearly went under and had really significant financial difficulties uh, a few years back when everyone thought they were in pretty good shape and they had uh, some extremely uh, wealthy uh, backers and some extremely wealthy financiers or some extremely sound financing in the West Ham banks. Nobody really saw what was about to happen with the West Ham banks at that time. Baltimore and Vladimir Antonov, well, I got a call at 6 a.m. Uh, on one morning in November 2011 uh, from one of my fellow directors at Baltimore saying that you, you've seen what's on Teletext, I think it's what you to. Um, and I said, uh, I said no, I haven't, I was standing in my front door. And uh, he said, you might want to turn it on. And so I went on and discovered that Vladimir Antonov, who was the Majority of the back in 90, 95% owned the club, had a European arrest warrant issued and was having his assets seized. Antonov was, of course, going back a couple of slides, Antonov was, of course, the owner who provided the personal guarantees and undertakings in relation to the finances of the football club. And then, you know, another, another example, which is not really about uh, necessarily so much about. Um, financial excess, but Nottingham Forest obviously uh, suffered and potentially could have uh, again suffered an, an administration event or an insolvency event on the back of the unexpected death of the uh, financial advisors. The pitch fund manager invested a really significant amount into the club, I think that's 60 million in five years, uh, and then unexpectedly died, and his family were not that interested in, in maintaining uh, the club and continuing to fund the club because you know, it was a so my point is actually, you know, there are just circumstances outside of the club's control, and when the club is not uh, living within its means, it is basically um, at risk from any number of uh, external factors uh, that could be its own good. Uh, so I go back now. So as, having said all of that, as Daniel said, there are some. There are some positive signs that we're seeing, particularly at the European level, and, and hopefully we'll see some of those uh, percolate down at domestic level. But there are still problems, and I've just quoted a few of the, a few of the relevant stats uh, over the last 12 months or so uh, in relation to uh, in, in relation to the domestic market. So last summer, uh, BDO did a football survey uh, of finance directors. Uh, across the football league, uh, sorry, across the professional, professional football clubs in England, so Premiership and Football League, and across the uh, Premier League in Scotland. They found that 65% of respondents uh, were still dependent on owner financing, and that number was 94% in the Championship, which is obviously pretty standard. Uh, and only 29% of respondents expected to make any profit whatsoever. Uh, and in fact, only three clubs in the Championship made profit from the 11 12 season, which was the uh, season that was reported last year in 13. So we're hopefully about to see the numbers for 12 13. Aggregate losses in the championship, so this probably goes against the, the, the trend at European level uh, that we saw earlier. Aggregate losses in the championship for 11 12 were 147 uh, million pounds, which is staggering amount of money, uh, especially when you, when you go back. Yeah, I can see that the 50 leagues deal for three years for its TV rights is £195 million. Uh, 
And I mean, for me, this is obviously one of the you know, one of the most striking stats. But the championship wage to turnover ratio averaged 89 percent. This was last year's uh, Deloitte uh, Football Finance report. Averaged 89 percent, but nine clubs in the 24 had a ratio of over 100 percent. And that just goes back to the casino point. You know, these guys are rolling the dice uh, on, uh, yeah, on the chance of getting the riches of the Premier League. But obviously every year, only three of those clubs uh, get, to, get to land on the right number. Uh, and the other 21 don't uh, and potentially suffer financial consequences. And the net debt in the championship is now, uh, is now actually only three, but one million that we were certainly pushing the one million last year. So financial fair play is absolutely vital in that context, but as I said, it has to be part of the wider package, and which is it's not going to solve problems uh, on its own. Um, so here I've just, I've just again referenced some of the things that perhaps we've touched on already. I've talked about the first uh, bullet point, the second bullet point, the Premier League regulations seeking to deal with, uh, with one of these issues through this secure funding uh, mechanism, which for me is probably the most significant aspect of what Premier League has done. Actually, it's gone relatively unimportant. Most of the most of the uh, noise about the Premier League then has been about that it's late for all this, so relying on and buying new kinds of losses. But actually, what they're doing is saying, if you aren't new losses, it's got to be pretty good for you. You've got to, you've got to sign up for uh, three years of funding at a particular level. Um, and it's that one of the mechanisms that they can use to do that is actually to say you've got to put that money in this way. So if you're planning, if your three-year business plan is to lose. Thirty five million pounds a year, you might have to stump up months and you would put it in account. So the Premier League know that even if something goes wrong in your uh, in your other external businesses, you've committed that money and that money can be given on uh, to the club's purposes. And there as I said, so FFP may be part of the solution, but it needs to be accompanied by measures to enhance competitiveness. I've referenced there the US model, uh, which is obviously um, a lot more Socialist, for a moment, uh, uh, in terms of the way it manages its sports and competitions. So, the, the distribution of resources uh, within US sports is, is done pretty much on an entirely uh, even handed basis. They can do that more easily, of course, because they don't have uh, things like delegation information. Uh, but we do need to think about ways in which uh, we can enhance the competitiveness of our uh, uh, football competitions, not just in the US, but in but in Europe as well, uh, particularly if FFP, as we expect, pushes some of that investment in the young generation. More rigorous controls over ownership, as I, as I touched on, a lot of the issues here do stem, uh, do stem from ownership issues. Uh, I mentioned the German model earlier. The German model, I don't know if everyone is aware of it, but the German model, in terms of ownership, is actually that um, all the clubs, more or less all the clubs in the German Bundesliga, have to be uh, majority owned by the supporters. So they have a rule called the 50 plus 1 rule. So 50% plus 1 share of all German clubs has to be held by supporters. What that means is there is a significant disincentive for investors to go in because they can't actually have control of interest in the club. And what that means alongside the financial controls that are in place in Germany is that German clubs basically run a pretty few range of forward links in profit. They do that whilst charging low prices, whilst having, the, having most fans uh, go to their games when they leave from Europe and in fact generating the biggest commercial revenues when they leave from Europe. Uh, and in recent past at least uh, dealing with success on the pitch. And I think that's one of the things that has uh, brought the German model to uh, the forefront of people's minds. In fact, they've done all of those other things for a number of years, uh, but obviously until certainly until uh, last year perhaps uh, in the public side, they wanted to be bringing success on the pitch, and so, okay, that's all very nice, and we're doing things in a, in a very dramatic and organized way, uh, but we still got a few clubs starting out and talking about the European competition. And maybe we'll see that shift to maintain this season. And as I mentioned earlier, more transparency in the government's regime. All of these things, I just end on, uh, I just end on a couple of points. That are kind of legal, uh, perhaps yeah, slightly legal, but are really, really significant for anyone thinking about 
the regulatory regime in football. Football is a private, has a private regulatory environment. So there isn't any statutory basis for you know, changing the rules in football. Governments can't do it. Uh, it's a private environment, so the competition organizers and uh, government bodies, so the PFA and the leagues in this country, make those rules. And they have voting structures, which means that the people who are being regulated, uh, the clubs, are able to vote on whether or not those regulations uh, are voting and take force. So all of these controls that we've talked about may be very nice in practice, but actually in reality and in Political reality of the way that it works and the voting reality of the way that it works can be incredibly difficult to improve. And that's why uh, you know, the things that I've talked about that have been talked about in Europe in 2008 and 2009 have taken you know, five years essentially you know, to actually come to fruition. And just my, my, final, yeah, my final point on all of that, which is that for me it's incredibly important that those challenges are met because. For me, I would like to see English football respected not only around the world for having the biggest and most glamorous competition, but actually being respected and recognised for being the best government sporting competition that involves football. And I think we're quite a long way away from holding that place. Uh, I'd like to think of some of the things that we talked about tonight have been in place over the 20 years uh, we might get closer to. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Lott. So we have uh, 15 minutes uh, to ask uh, questions. So who wants to start? Uh, good much to see you. It's something you've seen at once or twice. But with uh, sort of New York and Melbourne franchises and the city brand around the world, and between Melbourne City, of course, and I'd be calling Manchester City for on scouting for something like a hundred million. How is that? How is that going to go in terms of transferring their IP between groups of the same umbrella? Is that something to be considered in this process? Very good. It is. That's not an easy question. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yes. So in the in Manchester City's latest. 13, so 12, 13 accounts. There is reference to the sale of IP rights from City to various under, um, undertakings. I'm not sure whether they are connected undertakings or whether they're selling them at market value, whatever it may be. So, what UEFA's club financial control body will be doing, it's the best body will have been doing at present, is almost certainly liaising with Manchester City to understand the, the nature of the deal. To understand um, the connections of Manchester City with the other contractual parties, and then to come up with um, a decision whether it, it is a what's called a related party transaction, whether that then transaction is at uh, an overvalue, um, and then it can potentially be adjusted uh, accordingly. But to get it right, if it's not a related party transaction and the, the definition of that is relatively narrow, then they can't investigate behind the, uh, the actual revenue that itself. You mentioned that in the private regulatory environment, some clubs to vote decisions. And as we all know, there are some, at best, unsavoury characters running clubs, and worse, that are equivalent. Um, what do you think could be done so that it's not just some absolutely disreputable people who are voting on what group should be? That's a big question. <laughs> And the answer is it's not straightforward. I mean, obviously, um, you know, over the last two years, there has been a, a very significant investigation and inquiry done by government, government celebrity into football governments in this country. And they've made a series of quite partisan recommendations. And actually, if anyone who has an interest in football governments, I would strongly recommend that you dig out the second report on football governments that the PCS has selected. They reported in 2011 that came out. In 2012, the follow up as a group. Um, and yeah, I'd strongly recommend reading it because actually, I think they made about 90 recommendations. And uh, I, mean, I don't think in my 10 years plus of being in football uh, that I've seen a better uh, kind of summary of 
the things that are wrong with uh, football infrastructure in this country and some of the solutions uh, to it. So, um, successive ministers, sports ministers, have uh, basically held the sort of damages over the football authorities to say, if you don't sort your um, shop out, we will step in and we, the government, will come in and legislate. But to date, that uh, threat has been reasonably high. Um, and I think now that we're in the, in the election cycle that we're in, I can't see that. I can't see that coming to pass between now and 2015. Um, but I do hope, whether it's <coughs> whichever government or coalition takes over in 2015, that they pick up that. Um, they pick up that rule. Because I think it is incredibly important for government to hold to account uh, and to make sure that they're running the national security and it's supported by a small number of people who care passionately about it in this country. Um, but it is run properly. Um, and I obviously feel strongly having been chief elected with supporters direct, and for me, supporters direct is, is one of the one of the very few organisations that tries to do that in a you know a semi-private capacity. So you know it doesn't have the it doesn't have the uh, powers of government but it tries to uh, to maintain a level of focus and awareness of some of those issues and hold the football bodies to account. So the answer is it's incredibly difficult. But the other point, and so the counterpoint to that is yeah, obviously government intentions are But in reality, as a private regulator, you do want people you're regulating to um, ultimately, at least in the majority, to agree with what you're trying to do. Uh, because if you don't, you end up potentially just uh, just promoting some sort of anti avoidance or you know, avoidance mechanism. I, I experienced that when I was trying to bring in new regulations for the uh, management of agents in this country. And you know, if, it, if you don't take enough people with you, then you're just trying to circumvent those regulations and actually you know, moving, uh, you know, moving the bar or making real progress. So I think it's a it's a very difficult balance, um, but I do, as I said, I think it's really important that the government continues to hold particular bodies to account, not just with the government, but with the constitution that they're doing that. Hey, just a quick question for both of you, actually. I was wondering, how, how real do you think the risk is to the police financial fair play regulations given like Richard Tudor coming out recently and, and saying what he said, and also, as you mentioned, the possible legal cases from the clubs like Facebook and Leicester. And we've got a search one in the Do you want to say that? So, what, how real How, how real is the risk? Yeah, so, how real would you view by sort of risk is of the maybe some legal challenge? Yeah, challenge or if they have to reform the, the fair play regulation. Yeah. yeah. I know Daniel probably wants me to take that because he's stirring up legal challenges. <laughs> Obviously, one of the reasons he comes to speak is to make sure that people are aware of where to go when, uh, yeah, when uh, all of these disputes arise. My law firm's website. Yeah, exactly. I even gave him 30 seconds here. I even gave you the branding. <laughs> um, but no, in reality, yeah, I, I mean, I think the risk is real because. When there is significant financial gain or loss at stake, people will take that. Uh, you know, people will take that very seriously, and if they think they've got the opportunity to to litigate, have a fight about it, um, and that that might mitigate some of their uh, potential potential financial harm to them, then they will do so. And that goes back to the question asked down here about uh, you know about regulating through consensus. So the difficulty that those clubs have. Because obviously the, those rules have been brought in and voted for by a majority of the clubs in the championship and the, you know, the processes and the democratic processes for bringing those rules in uh, has obviously been followed. And so it is, you know, in that sense it's quite hard to say, well, we don't like it, unless you can get another majority of clubs to turn the clock back and say, actually, we want to, we want to check, we want to move the goalposts. Mm -hmm. Now that it looks like it might, it might really affect us, we want to move the goalposts. But I would say, you know, given the given the, the numbers that are at stake, and particularly in relation to the luxury tax that we didn't bring 
tank sanctions, is there where it's final? Is there legal recourse for these teams? And if so, who's the, the arbiter of the value? Then obviously the pump's going to say they're, they're getting value out of these deals in the way of the same things. In the end, um, there is recourse to the Court of Arbitration to support the design. That's where um, that's a deal that will effectively be in the summer. And they will, I think, effectively have to um, engage significant accounts to resource, I think, um, because they will have the ability to relook at um, the decision by the financial control body as to the appropriate sanction if that's what's appealed and or the um, classification of certain deals and what values. So in the, uh, in the summer, relatively soon, we'll see those first cases being appealed to pass. We'll have to come up with decisions relatively quickly in advance of the new Champions League uh, and Europa League season. Um, and that's where the best decision will lie because all of those decisions um, and the rationale are made public. So you will have really detailed, interesting analysis that anyone will be able to see of specific instances of where you wait for a for financial control body to come to an initial decision and then passes out you and agree, disagree, or change the tax accordingly. And as Andrew said, I mean, a lot of that they will have to engage uh, probably quite a significant financial resources, but of course that's, you know, uh, assessing the fair value of transactions is, is <coughs> a very normal thing for, uh, for accountants to do when they're giving a, giving a professional view on fairness, the truth of fairness of accounts. So that's a normal process, but obviously in this context, there are some pretty high stakes. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's fair to say lawyers and accountants around the football space will potentially do quite a lot. Last question. Uh, probably one for you. Um, on the on the sanction side of it, you mentioned January the 15th of the football league. Will that sanction then, if for example it's a transfer ban, will that come in for that window? And also, it will, and um, you mentioned there, there are some exceptions. So if you sell a player, you said five percent that you said of their value or the gross salary. What are the exceptions? Can this be signed and agreed when they bring it to the The main one is the 75% um, reinvestment point. Um, so you take into account the transfer fee and wage going out, and you can bring in 75% of um, that amount to a new for a new player. The other exception, I think, is if your squad is below a certain size then you're allowed to bring in um, players, I think, on a free or on a limited uh, budget coming in. The main actual thing, I think, for championship clubs who are spending huge amounts on transfer fees at the moment, uh, or potentially the re-signing re or the current players that they have in on their books, is that whilst they've got that transfer, effectively a transfer embargo on, on the signing of players. That's the first step. Yeah, mine was more of a more theoretical. If you consider there's no real sort of differentiation in back office, <coughs> why would the FA impose a sort of shared service model across the entire community? Well, in terms of running the financial fair play process, yes. but, but, but from everything from infrastructure right away to building to every facet of everything, so that the yeah, only differentiation is really in players, you have the way so. So, well, uh, if, you, if you go back a while, a generation or two, that's pretty really closer to what happened. And the reason that, I guess the reason it's um, fragmented, the way it's fragmented, is because the clubs at different levels have different interests and also different concerns. So the concerns of, of the 20 clubs who compete in the Premier League are driven as much by, when I said at the outset, they're driven as much by what goes on in Europe and being able to compete with those clubs in Europe as it is by what happens to us. At the bottom end of the two, the concerns and the scale of those concerns are very different. So the leagues, I mean the leagues are basically just a, a collection of interests, right? So the league is just the same sort of clubs themselves, they're the shareholders, and they say actually we've got a collective interest in operating in a particular way. And the way we want to operate might be different from the way those other clubs and clubs want to operate. And so, you know, the way the way the league infrastructure has developed over you know, a number of years is that there has been that separation of different levels and trends. It's fair to say there are lots of there are lots of areas I think where the question is a really good question as to why there isn't more shared uh, shared resource. 
And it does apply to the regulatory landscape because actually, you know, does it really make sense that you have three different bodies regulating different parts of football in slightly different ways? And that should be much more joined up. Firstly, I think it should be much more joined up from a practical point of view, but I also think it should be much more joined up from the point of view of the outside world and understanding who does what and when. Because I think you know, it does cause confusion and unnecessary conversation. Okay, thank you very much.